Hey, thanks for joining us here as we kick off the new message series, The Hope of Your Calling. This month, we will talk about the source, the purpose, the unity, and the results of your calling. I hope this series will help you answer the call God has on your life. Enjoy the message. Glad to see everybody here today. And I grew up in a time, maybe you did too, when there was something called Ma Bell. Remember that? AT&T used to be called Ma Bell. And there was a feeling back when I was growing up that there was a danger, like that they would become a monopoly. And they felt that their image was being tarnished because it seemed like their purpose, according to what people were saying was, you just taking advantage of us because we've got to use the telephone and you're the only game in town. And because we have to use your telephone, you're a monopoly. And now we got to pay you all this money and you don't care about us. All you care about is making money. So what they did was they tried to soften their image And some of you might remember the commercials when they came out. It goes something like this, reach out and touch someone. Reach out and touch someone. They were trying to soften the image because they were trying to remind the people the design of the telephone was just not two-way communication, but it was heart-to-heart communication. To call your son who's off in college, to call your husband who's in another state, they tried to do that. Well, God's trying to call us. I believe that God has something that he wants to say today, and we need to hear loud and clear what he's calling us to and calling us about. So as we talk about this idea the entire month, we got some power pack sermons coming up on the hope of your calling, the eight ringtones of Jesus. So let's ask God to be with us today. Let's take a few seconds just to pray and ask God to help us to focus on what he's saying to each individual person. Let's pray. Father, we're here today and we believe, God, that you have made us to be your people. And you have called us, Father, to do something incredible, but more importantly, to become something incredible. I pray, Father, that the reality of who we are in you would take root deep down in our hearts. They would see, Father, the reason that you have called us and the purpose behind that. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before we get into the callings and how God calls you, the very first thing you have to understand, if you don't get this right, nothing else is right. Nothing. Nothing will work. Everything hinges upon this particular thing, the predicated notion that this, Jesus Christ has created you and me to be something for him. And it is this. If you don't get this right, nothing else works. You are an object of his affection. You are an object of the affection of God, that God has made you and created you for no other purpose than this. Not for what you could do for him, he doesn't need us, he wants kids. And you are the object of his affection. So as we go through this, I want you to understand that that is the very basis of everything. The cross of Jesus Christ is the reason we're here. You don't need to earn rights with God. I mean, if you have to earn rights with God, then what what in the world is the cross for? Jesus died for you and for me that we could have access, full, wide open access to the Father who loves us with an everlasting love. God is a God who communicates all the time. Matter of fact, we call the Bible the Word of God. Jesus, one of the titles of the name of Jesus is the Word of God. God communicates all the time. He's always saying things. He's always, if we will listen, he's always trying to tell us something. Matter of fact, in the Bible that Jesus asked over 300 questions, always communicating, question after question. He asked 300 and almost 200 questions were asked of him. By the way, Jesus only answered three of them directly. Somebody said, I have that Holy Spirit gift from God. I avoid answering questions. I heard that amen. One amen out of crowds, my wife. Now, by the way, you are forbidden, forbidden to talk to my brother Chuck. And probably his wife Brenda and Logan and Hannah. Don't talk to them. Because Nathan was up here last week and he told a bunch of lies on me. My brother knows me more than my son. Nathan lied, lied all the way, he just lied. He told lies on me, lie, lie, lie. Do not talk to Chuck, you're forbidden to talk to him. He's got scars on his body. Glad to have you guys, give him a hand. They come all the way from Kentucky and from Dallas, Texas. My prayer is today that when Jesus calls, he does not get a busy signal. Think about that for a moment. God's trying to communicate. God's trying to call us. 
So in the scripture that we're talking about, it says there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope of your calling. In the reality of this, I want you to hear something in this portion of scripture. You can read it all the way through verse 16, 1 through 16. If you read that verse, it ties four concepts together. The concept of love, the concept of unity, the concept of calling, and the concept of oneness. So when you think about those words and how they intertwine with one another, your calling is not about you at all. It's about other people. Unity, oneness, love, object, God, calling you, loving you. It's interwoven in this concept of calling. So others have to be included in the amalgamation of your calling. So whatever you think about calling and what God's called you to do, and I'm not talking about being a pastor or a missionary necessarily. I'm talking about the call on your life to be his kid. What does that look like? It always includes other people. First call I want to talk about is the earthly calling. What I mean by that is the fact that we are not entitled to this life that we have been given. It is not a reward that we're something so wonderful. We did this awesome thing in another universe. Think about it. You're sitting here today in a world of billions of people. And it's one thing to sit back and look at billions of people going by and realize there's an earth, there's a planet called earth and that God made people. But think about it. You're sitting there right now today looking through your eyeballs. You are behind, I'm sorry, you're behind those eyeballs. And my other eyeballs fell. (laughs) Think about that. Don't let that distract you. Think about that. You're looking through these eyeballs. Why are you here right now? Why this moment? Why this time? Why you? It's one thing to know there's billions of people on the planet. It's another thing to know you're here. And you think about this idea that it's not an entitlement. It is a privilege to be born. You know, in the very first chapters of the book of Genesis, God says, let's make man in our image. You know what that means? To make man in our image, God is a tripartite being. In other words, there's three in one. You're three in one too. You have a body, soul, and a spirit. You're you're, you're an image bearer of Almighty God. And God has something for us to do. Matter of fact, he said, I put you in the garden to tend the garden. So there's some functionality there, some creativity there. There's some authority there. There's some power usage there. But you know what it really means? If you are an image bearer of Almighty God, that means every single human being on the planet is worth a whole, whole lot. You're an image bearer of the almighty God. Every human being bears the image of God. True value comes from this idea that God put us on this planet and we have tremendous value. I think Tony talked about it. Nathan mentioned it too. Humility is something that is very lacking in our culture because our culture right now, all it knows is power. Power is the name of the game. Now, when I was growing up, you got power different ways. When I was growing up, you get power from doing the right thing, from uh, obeying the mores or the morals of society, the ethics of society. Right now, that is gone. That is gone. So what what do our kids do? Little secret, they're trying to figure out how to use power. They're trying to use power. And you know what? A church can gain more power by succumbing to the cultural demands. If the culture tells us we want you to compromise just a little bit of the word of God, And if you do that, we'll give you a little more power. I don't care. We are not going to compromise that. I don't care if I'm preaching to two people. I don't care. We are not going to compromise because the threats and the power usage of the culture. You say, what are you talking about? I will guarantee I'm going to be really right out here with you. You ask your kid, what gives you more power? Little, little, uh, even in elementary grade, you ask him, what gives you more power, being heterosexual, bisexual? When I grew up, I'd get you punched in the face. What gives you more power? It's about power. It's not about these issues. It's the cultural saying, if you will compromise here, church, you know why churches are telling people it's okay to have all these different kinds of lifestyles? Because they get power from that. They get money from that. I will not lie to you. I will not change this book because the culture demands it. We can't. We can't. We have to have a sense of humility that God had designed us and made us and the design of God is critical. Humility is a big factor in that which we are seeing lacking because in our culture, humility is weakness. I don't know if you know this guy's name, Alan Rogers, anybody know Alan Rogers? He's not a soccer player. He's a quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. Any Packer fans? Huh? 
Aaron, what did I say? Alan? Oh, Alan's on the brain. I saw his tape and I'm like, Aaron Rodgers, sorry. Alan, I'm, you're dead, man. No. Um, <laughs> now, here's a man. He's a quarterback for the Green Bay. Any Packer fans? Yeah, okay, well, we don't like him anyway. Anyway, <laughs> NFL season. But he, you got to say he's a good quarterback, right? You got to say he's got some feelings. He's got some talent. He's got some things going on. This man, what they say about him is this. He may be all prideful in every other area, but he says this about himself and other people say it. He says, I love to be coached. I love people to tell me how to do my job. I'd be like, they need to listen to how to do my job. I know how to do my job. I'm the one of the number one quarterbacks ever in the NFL, and I know how to throw the ball. I don't need to listen to you. But he has humility in the area saying, you know what? People can teach me something. Got a teachable heart. He realizes that he loves to be coached by really smart coaches. God is the best coach ever. He has given us every single thing pertaining to life and being God-likeness, to being like God. Now, everything I see because of what I've been studying has to do with design, everything. And I don't know if you realize it or not, but everything has a design. Everything has a purpose. It has a design. And God's done that, but mankind replicates design. I don't know. You know what this is, right? You put ketchup in it, right? Have you ever thought, who invented that? That's like, like for three french fries, come on, give me something to put some ketchup in. But do you know that if you know the design of this thing, if you peel this little top layer, before you put ketchup in it, by the way, you peel this apart and you open it up, it will hold about three times the amount of ketchup you normally can put in one. That's by design. That's why this design is far superior to this one, because this one don't change. You know what else? This ketchup bottle, this has been changed. Now it's like squirty. <laughs> Didn't always do that. Used to be like, remember the old bottles? Remember how it had Heinz 57 right here? You wonder, ever wonder why they, put, they went through all the trouble to imprint that glass with 57? You know why? You know what that, where that mark is on that bottle? That is the sweet spot to bang on. I bet you didn't know that. It's designed for that. Well, God has design too. And when we live life by God's design, we can see the power of God move through our life. God has designed everything from marriage, relationships, raising children. It is by design. In 1985, then President Ronald Reagan addressed the CPAC conference. If you know what CPAC is, kind of help the president get elected. He went, why does he go there? He's already the president. He doesn't need these people. They're utilitarian. They've already given up their power to make him the president of the United States. He comes to that conference and he says something to them. He actually quotes a band. Anybody remember the band Asleep at the Wheel? Who said, yeah, you're old, man. <laughs> but you might remember the song. If you didn't remember the band, because it's like not our genre, right? But if you remember the song, it goes like this. Dance with the one who brung ya. President Reagan got up in front of CPAC and said, this is why I'm here. I want to dance with the ones that brung me. I want to dance with the ones that maybe be here today. I want to dance with the God who made me. I want to dance. I want you to dance with the God who brung you into this world because it is by his design, it is by his power, it is by his doing that you are here. Not evolution, but by design. Reality says this. In the, in the area of dancing, there's always somebody leading. The Father can lead you. There's always someone following. That's you. The music is the design, which is the word of God. If you follow God's design and the way God has made it to be, you will become successful. You say, well, why am I successful? I don't need all this stuff. You know, some of the highest ranked people on the planet go to big Ivy League schools like Yale and Princeton and Harvard, these big schools. And if you can go to Yale and Harvard, you got it going on because your parents had to come up with a lot of money and you've got best, the best education from the elementary grade on up because you're accepted into Yale University. But in 2013, a report came out from Yale University that said this, the council found that over half of the undergraduates that were enrolled in Yale University were seeking mental health counseling. Over half. What? I thought you got it going on. Your mama's got money, your daddy's got money, you got all this stuff ahead of you, and yet you've got to go for mental health counseling? Kind of puzzled them for a while. 
This year, Yale University opened up a class. This class was about how to have the good life. You know, the best life now, that kind of thing? Good life. It was a psychology course. It is the highest attended course in the 316 year history of Yale University. The highest. There was over 1,200 students enrolled to figure out how to have the good life. Guys, I thought you were the good life. You're seeking mental health. You're having to figure out what the good life is by going to a class. They didn't even have room. They didn't have a place even to hold the class. Over a whole, a whole quarter of the entire school went to that class. They said they're not going to do that again. They don't have room for it. He said, well, that's just because of the way they presented it or something. No, the same exact thing happened in Harvard University in 2006. Harvard University offered the same type of class on teaching people how to coach them in life. 800 Harvard undergraduates attended that class to try to figure out how to have a good life. Well, I'm here to tell you how to have a good life. It's finding God's design and operating in that design. That's how you have a good life. You do it God's way, as my wife says. You get God's results by his design, if you follow his design. His design is to bring into this world to find something. God has an answer. And if you can answer this question for your young people, you'll save yourself a lot of headache because all they want to know is how do you get power? They're not going to get power by obeying parents. They don't get power by that. They get, by, they get power from disobeying parents. They don't get power by being good. They get power by being bad, right? Think about it. Our kids are growing up in a generation where they do not believe there's any real meaning to life at all. Well, I am here to tell you that if you tell your kids and not only tell them, but demonstrate the power of God in your life, it will, they will recognize that power and say, I want the real power. I don't want pseudo power. I don't want the world's power. I want the power of the Holy Spirit. We need God's spirit in our homes. My youngest son used to say that dad, dad, that's two-toned. What he meant by that was you say one thing at church and you're something else at home. He was talking about somebody else though. You know what I'm saying? You, you do this and then you go home and then you treat your wife like crap. This is not the power that they, they don't believe it. They want something with real power. You want to show a kid a real power? Do what Paul said. I don't come to you with persuasive words of wisdom or power and authority because I'm your parent. I come with the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit in me can show me how to parent my child. Don't bring him to me. Somebody came to me and said, hey, I need to bring my whole family and talk to you to get this dry. I said, look, you're the parent. God's given you special parental wisdom. We got to figure out how to get you to be the conduit of God in your home. Yeah. Not come to Pastor Dan. Because they're not going to listen to me. I'm the principal. They're not going to listen to me. God has the answer by design. If you do this thing, because it is God's intention that you succeed in life. It is God's intention that you make it. It is not God's intention for you to struggle the rest of your life. Matter of fact, God likes creatures. And one of the creatures he really loves is the eagle. Eagle is designed to fly. He talks about the eagle and compares us, his people, to the eagle 33 times in scripture. Because you are designed to succeed. You are designed to catch that in your wings. You are, des you are designed to be able to find the flow of the Holy Spirit and the upward draft of God, if you will, the, the thermal updraft and soar. You're not supposed to be the starling that fumbles around on the ground and the dog eats it. You're supposed to fly. You're supposed to succeed. He brought us to this life, not to put us through torture and misery, but to have us succeed. You're also called to grow. Called to grow. Here's the deal. I will give you the key to moving in power and authority. Anybody want that? I would need that. Anybody want that? You want power to succeed and to grow? There's one thing you have to do in order to do that. If you do not do this, you will not have power in this life. You will just be tossed around by every little thing that happens. That portion of scripture we're dealing with talks about how to mature until we all come into the unity of the faith and to mature man so we're not tossed to and fro. If you want the key to real power of a fulfilling life, I'm talking about a fulfilling life where you just sit down and you say, you know what? I love Jesus and I have no plan B. That means you must be available to God. Sounds kind of simplistic. But if we keep getting busy signals when the Holy Spirit calls us, 
beep, beep, beep. We're not available for God. We're not available to do what God's called us to do. Unless you're available, God cannot move through you. There are no reserves. There's no plan B. You must have what I call interactive sellout to the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, I need you to take my life. I want to operate by your design. I don't want to do it my way anymore. Jesus does not do conference calls very well. He wants direct lines. He wants a direct line. You know what, some people think that what God's really after is just giving information transfer. Like, I wanna, inf- I wanna transfer information from Pastor Dan to me, and then I use it and do what I want. He doesn't want information transfer, he wants transformation. Transformation. And to get transformation, Jesus doesn't wanna just own your thoughts, just doesn't wanna own your head. He wants to put fire down in your bones. He wants you to move by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to see success happen. Many times he gets a busy signal. What's a busy signal? Well, it's almost four years, well, three and a half years ago, I guess, God got a busy signal when he called me. And I recognized it. I was, I, I was sick. I, was, I had unexplained trips to the hospital. I'd be sick on and off. Many of you know, when I first came into the ministry, they thought I had Lou Gehrig's disease. And I had a lot of neurological quirky thing. I had blood infection. I had weird stuff happening to me all the time. And, I, and God kind of spoke to me, unless you take charge of your temple of the Holy Spirit, unless you do something different. You see, Nathan talked about my zebra cake addiction. That was not what he was lying about, by the way. I love zebra cakes. If I had a bad day, I grabbed two or three of them bad boys on the way home and wolf them down. Then we got a candy machine. I grabbed oatmeal pies. Mm, I'm getting hungry. I haven't had candy for over two years. That wasn't what he was lying about. That was really true. I would hide M&Ms. I would not share my M&Ms with anybody. (laughs) Jesus would come back. He would get only the red ones. So I'm allergic to those. You know what he lied about? I don't run eight miles a day. But I can run eight miles. I do run. But when God got a hold of me, he said, Dan, unless you get this fixed, you're going to have tubes in your body. You're going to be in the hospital. You're going to be go- and you're going to have a busy signal. Your health is going to bring a busy signal when I call you, and I need you to finish to the end. I need you to do this, and I need you to be here for me. So it wasn't about me being like this health food nut and a tree hugging kind of person. That's not what it did. He said, I want you to be available, and the only way you can be available is you need to knock off the way you're living. You need to take care of yourself. Spiritual growth. I'm really into this design thing, if you can't tell it, but you know what? If you go 11 days without sleep, 11 days without sleep, you will die. Go try it. Don't try it. But some of you live years with three hours of sleep at night. It's transgressing the design, the natural order of God, and I will guarantee you, it may not happen today, it may not happen when you're 30, it might not happen when you're 40, but when you get 60 like me, you start losing your mind because you have not flushed the brain out long enough in sleep, and it's, you've collected amyloid beta, and you've collected copra and tau protein in your brain, and now you've got Alzheimer's and dementia. It's coming to our generations because we have not made ourselves healthy enough to be available to God for the long haul. That's what I want. I don't, we can't go to the missionary field. We can't go downrange and do anything. If we're tied to a a machine for diabetes, because it's our own fault, not all diabetes, but some is. If I kept on the zebra cakes, that's what would happen. Happened to my dad, happened to my brother. It was gonna happen to me. God says, I want you to learn my design. I don't want you to resolve to this, to this, this, this idea that, oh, you got to go through it. Got to have back problems. Got to have back surgery. And you know what? Because you're carrying a little weight on the front side. No, nope. you're going to go along. You're eating crappy food. You're going to have to have a zipper club thing. You're going to have to have a heart issue. And I'm not saying that's for everything, but I'm just saying we, there are some things we can do to keep ourselves from having heart attacks. And then you go on and you keep eating your sugar, keep on doing it, drinking your beer. Guess what's going to happen? Then you're going to be sucked to a machine because your kidneys are blown out, your liver's blown out, and you're no good to me, and I can't use you. You're not available. I'm getting a busy signal when I call. Less is more in God's economy. The power of progress in our community, in our world, has made us 
thicker and thicker. For instance, you know what the third ingredient is on this? High fructose corn syrup, the devil's syrup. The next one's corn syrup behind that. I'm not picking on Heinz. It's all of our food. It's everywhere. But if we're not available to God, if there's a busy signal because we've, we've overcompensated that, I think we all suffer from ADD. Always doing something different than God designed us to do. Our whole culture does that. We violate him in every psychological, physiological, spiritual level. There are 14 things in your life that if you could put them in your life, it would help you be more available to God. That's what it's about. So we have also have a call to explore. A call to explore. You ever have this wonder and sense of how it could be, even though it's not right then? Like, what could it be like if God really energized our lives? What could it be like if we had this, this wonder of God that we could look at God, we could meditate upon his word, and we could grab that thought of God and bring it into our life and see the power of God manifested in us? Can you imagine the potentiality of the people of God standing in that fullness of the Holy Spirit doing what God's called us to do? You know, if you started meditating just 10, 15 minutes, I'm not talking about yoga, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about getting in the word of God, meditate on what he says, use eagles. If you don't meditate, try, just look up eagles and meditate on what God says about eagles. Focus on it, focus on it. You do that. If you struggle with attention problems, you struggle with self-control problems, I guarantee you'll see a change within three weeks. Three weeks! If you carry that out a little longer, two or three months, if you suffer from depression or anxiety, it has been proven that when you concentrate through medit Christian meditation, the gray matter that controls anxiety and depression will shrink. And the gray matter that has to do with focus and concentration will grow. Just from God's design. Maybe God was right all along. Meditate upon my word. Hide my word in your heart that you might have a fulfilled life. You might find out what I've called you to do. Call to explore, call to salvation. If you wanna know more about this, I'll be talking about this today in starting point class in about 20 minutes. But here's the expectation of God, that people will come to know him. If you read Acts chapter two, verses 41 through 47, it talks about what happened in the early church. You know what happened? Early church, 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people went in the tank. They didn't have tanks, but they got baptized. Now, that wasn't the, the cool part to me. You know what the cool part is? The next part of the verse, it says, and get God added daily to their number every day. He expects people to come to know him. Salvation is a call on everyone's life. Some of you experienced and accepted that call. Some of you need to hear the call. Some of you need to know, who is this Jesus you're talking about? Who created me? I want to know how that design works. Starting point class, or there'll be people up here in front to pray for you today. Call to a spiritual journey. Now this is the introduction. So we're gonna unload all of this through the entire month. Everyone is on a spiritual journey, every single person. But spiritual formation comes from this term, we've been using it a lot, self-reductionism, reducing self. Because here's what the Bible says, if you serve the world, if you serve mammon, if you get your power from mammon, I'll tell you, your kids right now, you know what they get power from? Lying. Situational ethics, you want to call it that? They don't have ethics. What's ethics? They don't even know what ethics is. Every time you say something to a child and they don't agree with you and they push back with their power, you know what they're saying? You got an agenda for me and I guarantee you, you don't care for me. That's what they're saying. Everyone is on this journey. Everyone's trying to figure out how to use all this. But God says, if you serve mammon, which is a personification of wealth, it is the world's sin. If you serve that, you're going to hate me. That's just the way this works. If you love me, you'll hate the world. You reject the thing of the world. Man's spirit was made to be eternal. God calls people to himself. Think of the marvelous gift of being born into this world, God calling to, you, to himself through salvation, and then allowing you to work side by side with him in the power of the Holy Spirit to do amazing things. Can you imagine what a wonderful gift that is to be with him forever? As your pastor... I give you permission to struggle. We all struggle. I give you permission to struggle. But hear me out. As a pastor and a counselor, I do not condone struggling for your whole life. 
My God sets people free. My God raises people up. My God can show you how to fly like an eagle. My God has set you free, and if you're free, you're free indeed. So you can struggle, but don't you say that's my life. I'm struggling, brother. You told me that 20 years ago. God says, I don't want you to struggle. I didn't design you to struggle. Just with the enemy, struggle with him if you want to struggle with something. How you doing, brother? I'm struggling. You have permission to struggle, but don't make it a lifestyle. Don't make it a lifestyle. What kind of glory does that give God? I'm just struggling. My Jesus don't have enough power to polish my shoes. You know what that says about our life? Well, I don't have enough Jesus to hold my marriage together. Ouch. There's not enough Jesus in my life to, for me to lose my uh, road rage. We're on a spiritual journey. Struggle, but don't stay there. Last month we talked about surrender. We'll talk a lot about this in here. But here's the deal. To flourish in your life, to really be successful in what God's called you to do, you have to learn not just how to adjust your life. It's not about adjusting your life. It's, it's, it's about self-life destruction, feeding the flesh. You hear me all the time say, say no to your flesh. Tell your body no. I'm not believing that about me. I'm believing what this book says about me. Negativity. If you're not available for God, you can't do what he's called you to do. You can't be the conduit of God's power. So there's no retreat. You can't have a retreat plan. There's no backing up. Either you're surrendering to God or you're surrendering to the world. You can't do both. And I'll be hanged if I'm going to work all my life and then surrender to the world. I've struggled in my life, but I'm not going to make it a lifestyle of struggle. That does not bring God honor. No retreat. The ministry. Now, when you talk about the ministry, you have to realize that people that are called into ministry are called to a people. I'm going to leave that there. You're called to a people. And I ask young pastor, as a young pastor, I'm called to be a pastor. Who's your people? I don't know. I'll figure out when I get there. That's like saying, who's your family? I don't know. I'll find one when I go there. You're called to a people. I know that Rockfish is called to a particular people. We are called to a community filled with military personnel, filled with people that are affected by the military. We are called to a people. So your calling is always to a people. And you have to have an authentic platform in which to operate from. Your kids, if they struggle, it's because of two-tone things. Like, I see this in what you say, your Jesus is all powerful, but, but dad, you don't have enough gumption to get off the couch and help with the dishes. Ouch. Availability is the key to ministry. You can be disqualified by marginless living. No margin, we don't have margin. Well, I got to squeeze this in. I got to squeeze a little bit more in. I got to impact that, do that. We don't have any time in our life. We're stuck in these life patterns because we somehow got this idea that if we play the world's game, we'll get money and that gives us power and we can live. Mixed up priorities, compromising. We get busy signals when we have poor motives. It all destroys the ministry. Think about when Jesus Christ called somebody to follow him. He didn't say, well, I want you to restructure your life a little bit. You know what he said? Oh, Jesus, I'd love to come and follow you, but I gotta bury my dad. He said, well, let the dead bury the dead. He went, what, what'd you say? Let the dead bury the dead? What? That means give me your time. I need your time. There's no place. There's no, there's a busy signal. Oh, a busy signal, thank, don't bother following me. Other guy comes in and says, Jesus, I got all this money. I got money. I got, I got the ability to get some stuff done. And you know what? I could help take this money and help you do your ministry. And we could do this. I'll follow you. He said, uh, wait a minute. One thing I want you to do, go take all your money, all your stuff, sell it and give it away. Jesus don't need our money. He needs us. You're not available. And you know what? He didn't follow Jesus because he had a lot of wealth, and that was where his tie-in was. The motive of the heart is always checked. In the scripture, in the book of Acts, you know, the, the magician said, I see real power when these guys pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to buy that. And they, they obviously, they said, you can't do that. They cursed him for it, but he knew where real power came from. Always checking the heart, always checking the motive, always checking, are you busy or are you not? And the last one is calling home. Phone home, E.T., Every one of us is going to get the call to go home. 
every one of us. It's a call. That you will not get a busy signal for. When you die, it is the best day of your life if you're a follower of Jesus. And what I want for every single man, woman, and child that I know of, and for me included, I know I've messed up, I got it, but at the very end of the day, I want to say no regrets, no regrets. I followed Jesus. I finished well. I don't care how your race is going right now. It might be kind of shaky. It might be limping along. But God says, I've got a design for you to make you soar like an eagle, and I want you to finish well, and I want you to say no regrets, none not how you run the race in the beginning, it's how you finish the race. Finish well. I would give you some things not to say to people when they're dying, because people say really dumb things when people are sick or dying. Oh, you have stage four cancer? Hmm, my aunt had blah, blah, blah. Maybe one day I'll do that, but I'm not gonna do that today, because I think there's something more important. I think we need to realize that everything that we have, there is no reason to have a regret in your life. I'm not saying that we thought our lives were perfect. I'm not saying that. But there, there is a way that we could live our lives. So in the end, when we finished the race, we finished it well. No regrets. There was no retreat. There was nothing reserved back. There's no plan B. If you'd stand with me for a moment, we'll close. But I want you to hear this story, so don't check out just yet. Remember I talked about, in the beginning, I talked about these Ivy League schools and how, you know, Harvard and Yale and Princeton and those kind of schools, how the kids that go to those schools, they're just like, got it going on. I mean, you would think they're the ones that are going to succeed. They should know how to live life. There was young, one young man who did find out how to live life. He grew up in a Pennsylvania town, and his mom and dad owned a mega, mega, mega company doing mining operations. Borden was his last name. Bill was his first name. He had attended the best preschools to college. He was getting ready to go to Yale University. But before he was going to go to Yale University, his parents, who had all kinds of money, all kinds of power, going to set him up in the business, set him up for life. So we want you to travel the entire world for a year on our dime. Crazy thing is, God got a hold of him, saved his soul. While he's traveling around the world the entire year, the only thing that kept hitting his heart was for the lost and the dying and the hurting and the broken. He came back and and his dad was very upset with him because he told his dad, he said, Dad, I don't want to go learn the family business. I don't want to go learn how to make it in the, in the market system. I want to give my life 100% to Jesus Christ. I want to be a missionary to China. They told Bill, Bill, that's a terrible waste of your life. They're not going to, China, what's in China? And what he said was, I want to go minister, get this to the Muslims in China. Wow, that's like a highway. That's like, that's really gonna fly. That's gonna be fruitful. They pretty much said, you're gonna waste your life. But he told him, no reserve, no plan B. I'm going, I'm going to China with the gospel. No reserve. Matter of fact, he went on and, and he found, they found out in Princeton that he had like three fourths of the entire school coming to a Bible study he was leading. Now, if I'm, a, if I'm a guy following Jesus and I'm doing stuff right, and I got three-fourths of, of the entire school coming to me to my Bible study, I'm planting a doggone church. I'm going to have me a cushy pastor job with a swimming pool. I'm not, I'm forget China. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. He says, look, no retreat. I'm going to where God sent me. I'm going where he told me to go. He told me to go to China. No retreat. Nothing held back. No reserve. The tragedy in this story was that when he graduated from from college, he went ahead and got his degree, and then he went on to a theological, got a theological degree. He wanted to be prepared. He wanted to be the best he could be because he knew when he goes to China, working with Muslims, this is going to be really hard, and I need every bit of the ammo I can get. He graduated. But before he went to China, he said, I need to go learn the Muslim faith. I need to learn what I'm dealing with. So I'm going to go to Egypt. I'm going to learn Arabic. I need to know how to talk to them. I need to relate to them. 
sad part is when Bill got to Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis. And he said, sir, you're gonna die. Shortly after, he passed away at the age of 23 years old. He found his Bible. In his Bible, he wrote, he wrote when he, his dad was mad at him, no reserve. He wrote in his Bible where, where he was saying, you know what? You can stay here and have a cushy pastor job. He said, no retreat. And then when he contracted meningitis, he wrote into his Bible, no regret. No regret, no regret. He ran the race. You could say he wasted his life. You could say that he, he went the wrong direction and God punished. You could say whatever you want to say, but he knew something. God had called him to do that. He wasn't gonna hold back for plan B and he was not gonna regret moving to where God called him to be no matter what the outcome was. He never made it to China, but he did make it to your ears today. If you're here today, close your eyes. You can hear this, close your eyes. Just, is there something in your heart that you're saying, I'm holding this back. I, I, I've compromised this. I, God called me right now and he'd get a busy signal. Maybe it's an area of your health or maybe it's your habits, I don't know. But maybe God's pulled on your heart today to say, I don't want you to have any retreat from coming to me. You can struggle, I got it. But let's make you soar like an eagle. So when you say, when the last call comes, you can pick that phone up and say, Father, no regrets. This world has nothing for me. I believe you're everything I ever needed and I wanna operate by your design from this day forward. Father, I pray for every person here that they would operate according to your design. They would find the power of the Holy Spirit operating in their homes with their children. Father, it would not be a guessing game. It would be the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit in real time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a good weekend.